Um, so I'll, I'll give I'll give you guys the the high level intro. So I'm Sean. I'm head of developer experience at Temporal. Um, and Temporal is an open source runtime for managing distributed application state at scale. This is a very wordy uh, definition, but it actually actually is accurate once you get to know it. <laughs> um, so the the why like this is the what uh, the why I always like to cover a little bit in my intros. So apologies if you heard me say this before, um, but to me, the most valuable mission critical workloads in any software company are long running and tie together multiple services. Temporal was started at Uber. Um, so Stuart, that's probably not where you uh, began hearing about us. Um, so our two co-founders built the predecessor to Temporal at Uber where it runs over 300 use cases, everything from driver onboarding to uh, customer email messaging to customer rewards, like the, the point system that uh, that you get after completing some action, all tracked by Temporal, um, as well as uh, quite a few key parts of Uber Eats as well. Um, at Checker, it drives um, the uh, background process check. Like, so uh, Checker is a background check company as an API. Um, and what they do is they check a lot of real life uh, um, criminal records or employment history records. And that may involve like a trip to the courthouse or something. So it's if eventually basically saying, imagine basically an API call taking several days uh, to resolve because it involves a human in the loop. They're actually presenting on our, our Tuesday meetup. Um, so you'll be, we'll be hearing more from them about how they use Temporal. Um, but I actually just found out, I think they have like eight, uh, seven or eight use cases using us. So I'm interested to learn more about that. Uh, Netflix uses us for their CICD system, Spinnaker, uh, as well as um, some like real-time uh, video processing thing, which I don't really understand uh, because uh, it's that's a different team that I haven't talked to yet. Um, Coinbase does does not use us directly, but uh, uses uh, the predecessor Coinbase uh, uh, Cadence to do distributed transactions, and then Stripe also offers us as a platform within uh, the Stripe ecosystem. So uh, people, it's very similar to the, the Uber-like use case where there's a central team that runs Temporal as a service to the rest of the company. Um, <clears throat> so that just gives you, just, just gives you a, uh, an, an idea. There's a lot more logos on our landing page now. So um, this is, this slide will probably have to be updated. Um, but the, the main, the main idea is that a lot of the times when you're doing anything asynchronous, um, you will have to find yourself introducing uh, queues and uh, uh, databases and uh, ad hoc state machines and schedulers and cron jobs and stuff like that. And it becomes a very brittle uh, mess, which is uh, often the most important part of your code base, but the least confident part of your code base. Uh, and what we do is essentially give you a very well tested and very scalable architecture uh, by which you can organize uh, all of this long running asynchronous st stateful stuff. Uh, the other part, which I, I do like to point out, which is that a lot of times you're trying to do something stateless, but then because you uh, need to implement, uh, for example, retries and timeouts for any uh, external dependency, that becomes stateful and that turns uh, each of your components into a, a stateful component. Uh, whereas with Temporal, um, every uh, your app and your worker, um, which we'll talk about that, um, are can be stateless, whereas Temporal is sort of centrally responsible for all your state, um, which is what we talk about with uh, the original definition, which is that we manage your distributed application state. Another benefit of this system is that because we are splitting up your work into uh, your, your application, which kicks off some, some jobs, or some workflows, which is what we call it, um, and they are processed by workers. There are like a fleet, a horizontally scalable fleet of workers. Um, in essence, what that means is that to scale, you just throw more machines at it. Um, so it's a very um, scalable worker system. If you can, if you think about it that way, if, if that's what you're looking for, uh, we're not just a job processing system, but you can use us that way. Um, and then another thing that is also important to note about this design, which we'll cover later, um, which is that we're entirely event sourced internally. Um, that's not exposed to you uh, as a user. Um, but we get the benefits of event sourcing without the downsides of having to code it up yourself in the sense that uh, we have, we track the history of everything that happens in, in temporal server and we replay it on temporal workers um, whenever we need to. In, for example, if the worker goes down halfway through a, um, a execution, um, we would just be able to reinstate it on a different worker or the same one if you uh, started back up again. 
So it's a very uh, fault tolerant system because uh, every single uh, change in the state uh, is, is tracked by uh, uh, transactionally, uh, transactionally guaranteed to, to not have race conditions um, and is tracked by Temporal's uh, backend persistence layer. Okay, uh, but you're here for the Go, uh, Go SDK. So let's go a bit into the Go SDK API. Um, the reason, one of the reasons I like to bring up um, Uber actually is that uh, Uber is a Go shop and the SDK, the Go SDK is probably the oldest uh, that Temporal has. And so the most production battle tested or whatever you call it, because um, it's been in use for something like five years now. Um, okay. so. A workflow is, is kind of the, the workhorse of Temporal. Um, and what, what it does is it's essentially just a function. It takes in inputs and it takes uh, an output. Um, it has some, it has a, um, an injected context variable that is the first argument, uh, but otherwise you can uh, define whatever inputs um, that you want. Uh, in, in fact, we, in production, we actually recommend using a struct here so that it's backward compatible if you need to change uh, the API a little bit. Um, and it can optionally return an output, uh, but it's I, like I like showing this because it's it really is this this is the essence of the workflow. It's just a function, um, but just being just a function is not very interesting, right? It doesn't do anything interesting. So to do anything interesting, you then have to put that into an activity. And activities are where you put all the side effectful non-deterministic stuff. Like a workflow has to be deterministic uh, because that's what we do the event replay. Uh, but activities, uh, everything's sort of off, off the hook. Like uh, temporal, temporal doesn't look inside of the activity function boundary. So an activity is also uh, just a function, air quotes. Uh, but here you can do all the non-deterministic stuff uh, like file system access or uh, web um, IO or anything like that. Um, how you call an activity from a workflow, uh, you use the workflow.execute activity function, and then you to get the result, you use the dot get. Um, so that's pretty um, straightforward there. Um, this separation between workflows and activities doesn't seem very intuitive. Like basically this is an extremely over-engineered way to say hello world, but um, you get some benefits out of that from this basic separation. This is the really, really core fundamental thing to understand about Temporal, which is that you have to separate things into workflows and activities, but you get some guarantees out of that. that that's the fundamental the sort of contract or promise that we give you. And one of the most basic guarantees that we give you is that we give you timeouts and retries for every activity. So for example, um, this would be an example of a standard um, uh, retry policy and an example of a standard timeouts policy that are attached onto an activity uh, that would be fed into this workflow.execute activity function call. It's all stuck into that context variable. Uh, and you can you can define it however however way you like. Um, but this is all declarative, which is super nice. In other words, to implement timeouts and retries, you don't have to provision any infrastructure. You don't have to implement any complicated error handling or stateful logic. Uh, to handle all of this. Temporal does it for you just in that workflow.execute activity call, which is really nice uh, to when, when, you, when you think about what you would have to do to replace all this work. Um, let's talk a little bit about what a timeout uh, would, would mean. Um, so I like to explain timeouts with this diagram, which basically shows you the, the kind of three states that activities can be in when it comes to Temporal. So activities can either be scheduled, which means that, they, uh, that a workflow.execute activity call has been called. That's, it, that's scheduled, like some, um, we're, we're ready to, to, to call an activity. When an activity is started, that means a worker has picked it up uh, and it's, it's attempting an execution of an activity. And when it's closed, it means it's, it's uh, successfully uh, finished attempting that activity. So in other words, the start to close timeout is the timeout is the time that it takes for a single execution to complete. The schedule to close timeout is the time it takes for everything to complete, uh, inclusive of all the retries between uh, start and close, and also the pickup of uh, when it was scheduled, when it was supposed to go out versus when it, when it actually happened. There are two other timeouts, heartbeat timeouts and schedule to start that are more for more advanced use cases that you can read in the docs. 
Um, but so you combine that anytime the timeout happens, then it goes through the retry policy. Um, so the initial interval between retries would be one second, uh, but then the second retry would be two seconds because of a back off, back off coefficient. And this basically means we multiply the, the timeouts, uh, the interval between timeouts, uh, sorry, the interval between retries by two every single time. So that achieves an exponential back off factor. If you want to turn it linear and just set it to one, um, you can be, you can cap it at a maximum interval. You can cap the number of maximum attempts. Um, and you can also say like, if there, if the activity throws some unique errors, then don't bother retrying. Um, it's usually it's some user defined error that is meaningful to your application in some way. So uh, those are really useful concepts uh, that uh, that we're going to show in our live demo section later. But I just wanted to give you this understanding that this is a very well thought out system of retries and timeouts that you probably, uh, whatever you're trying to model asynchronously, uh, you can probably fit into this, uh, this system, uh, which is really cool because ultimately what that gets you is that when you're coding um, like this, you know, I, obviously I, I, um, uh, I left out some of the details, the, the, the heavier details here, but you're coding as though this activity just succeeds. Like uh, don't bother with the retry and timeout logic or anything like that. Just like, let's just, just code just code as this, as though failure was not uh, an option here. Obviously we cannot eliminate all failures, but we can push them very far to the tail end um, because we handle a lot of the network uh, unreliability issues that you might be facing when, when dealing with real life situations. Okay, I, I'll stop beating that uh, dead horse. <laughs> Two more things before I, I'll show you the overall big picture. So workflows are initiated by clients. Uh, the client can be anything. Client can be inside of a script that you run manually, or it can be inside a, an application in response to like a endpoint request. Doesn't matter. It, this is embedded inside of your normal Go application, right? So wherever that goes, uh, clients can go to. And all it does is it says, um, all right, I'm going to execute a workflow and I'm going to execute hello world dot workflow, whatever you call it. And I'm going to pass in some arguments there as well. So uh, again, whatever arguments you're, uh, your, your workflow function expects, that's what you should feed in as well. All of this is serialized over gRPC. Uh, so in other words, the you can actually execute TypeScript or Java or PHP or whatever other language uh, workflows from Go. Uh, so we're kind of polyglot in that sense. Um, we don't actually care what the, um, what the implementation detail of the thing is. From the client's perspective, all I'm doing is just calling that workflow by name and giving it the serialized arguments. Um, every workflow has a workflow ID assigned. Usually it's like a transaction ID or a customer ID or whatever ID you, uh, you need. And it also has a task queue. Um, and so this is um, queued up in, uh, on, this, on the server side with, um, um, with a free lightweight thing. Like basically uh, you, can, you can assign it whatever task queue makes sense for routing to specific workers that are listening to that task queue. So uh, while we're talking about that, let's actually go over to the workers because I mentioned them so much. Uh, workers are a special instance of clients um, that have registered workflows and activities for them to execute, and they're listening in on a task queue. So here we have the hello world task queue that is the same that matches the hello world uh, task queue on the client. Um, so this is a very simple system to distribute that work, right? Like clients kicks off all this stuff, uh, and worker receives all this and then starts uh, starts processing through it. You can have multiple of these workers. You can have multiple of these clients. Ultimately, the best way I like to to represent the system as a whole uh, is with this chart, which essentially shows um, what uh, the the main components and the moving parts of the system and how they talk to each other, right? So your application uh, or your um, technically the workflows are part of your application as well. So this is not very well named, uh, but whatever it is like your starter, your starting point, whether, whether it's a script or an app or a serverless function or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, embeds a temp it embeds a temporal client that calls out to temporal cluster using gRPC uh, on a task queue. And uh, there's, there's on the other side, there's a matching worker fleet uh, with the register workflows and activities that are qualified to, to pull that task queue also connects via gRPC to your temporal cluster and are uh, qualified to execute that work, right? So it's, it's, um, it's a very simple system, uh, but I think the operational model is, is important for you to understand in the sense that this deploys with 
parts of your application and then this deploys separately to, to parts of your application. Uh, you are responsible for all of this in terms, as an application developer and Temporal Cloud, which is us or, or your platform team. Uh, so whether or not you host it or you pay us to host it is responsible for Temporal Cluster, which to the application developer is a black box, but obviously we have talks uh, describing the architecture of Temporal Cluster if you want the whole thing's open source. Okay, um, any questions there before I keep going? Because uh, I just covered a lot of material. Uh, Andrew, you're muted, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm pretty good right now. Um, I just kind of want to keep going and then I'll have probably some questions more toward the end, but thanks. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, I'll cover a few Go SDK specific APIs and then we'll go into the live demo and then we're basically done. So the, um, the problem, so once, you're, once you've moved, like just moving everything into workflows activities, setting timeouts and retries and understanding the client worker uh, system, this is enough to get the, the real basic benefit of Temporal, uh, but we are not a timeouts and retries framework exclusively, right? We, we give you a lot more uh, beyond that. And it's really once you've moved stuff into the workflow that you start to be, get really creative. Um, so one of the one of the other constraints that um, so we give you a lot of workflow APIs, uh, but some of them we have to because one of the constraints about workflows is that you cannot do anything non-deterministic inside of a workflow. Uh, everything um, because of our need to replay everything, uh, we have to give you uh, deterministic alternatives to some of the goal constructs that you might be used to. So one of the examples that we have is selectors and features. Um, and this is comparable to the go select um, uh, keyword, as well as uh, features which are which kind of go together with the select uh, go selectors. Um, so the selector is kind of a way to race multiple conditions. Uh, basically, like it, it, it's kind of a way to defer um, work, but then also pick them off of, of a queue uh, of a of a particular stack. Um, so. Let me, let me just show you one. This is a very simple example. So here we're uh, creating a new selector. We're creating an activity. And then we're saying uh, uh, selector.add feature and then some feature work here. So it's kind of like that defer statement. Um, but what we're doing here is we're making it deterministic because it only executes when we call selector.select. Um, and so this is a this seems like a very artificial example. Like why would we actually need this uh, until you start introducing things where which can resolve uh, out of sync, out of order. Um, so for example, if we have a timer over here, so uh, we have a workflow.new timer functionality uh, that creates like a for example like a three second timer, and we put that in here together with uh, an activity that we also put that as an as a uh, feature in, into our selector, we can actually selector.select and that will pick the first one that uh, is actually being resolved, uh, whatever, whether or not it is the uh, external activity or it is the internal timer. Um, and that's a really interesting concept as well. Like you can start to build up a lot of interesting time-related options, uh, time-related behaviors uh, based on these primitives, which is pretty cool. Um, we have a bunch of code samples where it really spells out for you some of the uh, options that you can do with these uh, constructs. But I just want to introduce you to the idea that we have a bunch of uh, SDK APIs that give you all this functionality out of the box. I also want to make the observation that this timer uh, functionality is a durable timer in a sense that we could sleep for 30 days or 10 years, the default uh, workflow timeout is 10 years. Uh, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't consume resources while it's sleeping. Um, and it's the same functionality that we use to make sure that our timeouts and retries, this stuff is also durable to outages or to downtime in your workers because all of this is persisted to the backend, to, to the temporal server. Um, and that's a very interesting property that I'll, I'll show you more about. Stuart, it sounds like you had a question. Sorry, just clearing throat. Okay, no problem. Uh, we're almost done. Um, so another interesting way, another interesting form of feature that we can sort of throw in here is signals. Um, while your code is long running, you might actually want to send in more data while the workflow is still running. So um, 
of whether as a result of human action or a change in the external environment, whatever, you can send in information to your workflow while it's still uh, executing. And this also I find makes it different, makes temporal different from other job processing frameworks, which are basically fire and forget uh, systems. They once once you set them off, that they're they can't really be changed. They can be canceled, but they they can't really be altered uh, halfway. Whereas here we can actually say, all right, well, uh, get signal chat channel. And then we'll receive signals and we'll react to those signals in some particular fashion. So uh, signaling is, is the mechanism for getting data into a running workflow. Querying is, a, is the parallel uh, mechanism for getting data out of a running workflow. Uh, and those work together really nicely for you to write any um, uh, functionality that uh, creates some uh, interesting, very dynamic, long running workflows. Um, and I, I, really, I really enjoy uh, telling that story because I, I think it's it's just so fascinating what you can do with them. Um, but we're done with the, S the SDK API intros right now. Um, really, like there's a lot of other a APIs. So we have APIs for um, cron. If you want to just run a cron job, that's distributed. That's distributed. Um, so what's the difference between a regular cron job and a distributed cron? Uh, we can handle millions of simultaneous crons. Uh, that are farmed out to a fleet of workers, right? Like, and, and it's all very uh, fault tolerant and and, uh, and very well tracked, uh, which a lot of cross systems are lacking. Um, we can spawn child workflows. A workflow can spawn a workflow and then control them uh, externally, which is super nice. Uh, and again, like um, these are all just new primitives that are enabled for you once you've moved your stuff to a workflow. So that's why I'm so focused on getting you to migrate on onto a workflow activity. Uh, capability uh, as a base baseline because from there you can explore all the other cool stuff that uh, is unlocked. Uh, but we we're not just focused on workflow APIs. We're also helping you figure out security and authorization and not, uh, off off Z and off N. We're also helping figure out ma maintainability, so testing and versioning and workflow replay, as well as logging and observability. Uh, all of which are in the docs, so I don't I don't have time to cover for them. But uh, basically, I just wanted this slide is here to to give you the impression that. Yeah, we talk a lot about workflow APIs, but actually, uh, you know, in a real production setting, we also worry about the other stuff as well. So we're here for you. We're here to help you with that as well. Okay, so uh, let's go into the uh, demo code. So the way that you go here is I, I have a short link called temporal.io slash go, uh, and that gets you right into the, uh, the starting point. So this is where you start off uh, on the docs. And, uh, you, and it sends you to the samples library. I like to use Gitpod, um, which is a which it runs temporal in the browser, uh, which is really nice. Uh, basically, I just stick the Docker Compose in here, and then I run Docker Compose up, uh, and that that runs temporal in the browser for me. Uh, and then I have these two terminals for me to run temporal. Um, the samples library, or the samples repo, has all these uh, uh, example projects for you to check out. Uh, but here we're just going to go through the hello world and I'm going to show you some of the functionalities that I'm talking about. So uh, just a brief orientation to the code base. Um, let's actually make this, zoom this in a little bit. Um, okay, so the hello world.go file has both the workflow and the activity. Um, the workflow uh, is a very simple one. Like we have some extra optional logging stuff in here. Uh, but really, this is the same thing that we, that we talked about before. So uh, for example, activity just does string concatenation. Um, and I'm just make this nil for now so that we don't screw things up. Um, and, then, uh, and then the workflow calls the activity with a variable that comes in from the client. The client has, uh, the client calls that execute workflow um, and calls that hello world.workflow with some variable here. So I'm gonna change this just so it's obvious that we, uh, where the data is uh, flowing through. Um, so I'm just gonna say, hello, Andrew. <laughs> it's hard to be creative with, uh, with these variable and examples. Um, and then finally, uh, the workflows and activities are registered onto a worker, uh, which we can run multiple of, but here we're only just running one. So those, that's the main structure of the repo. There's also uh, an example of how we do testing, um, which is also worth exploring as you, as you go into testing as well. Okay, so um, let's run this. So here on the left, um, I, I I'm gonna have uh, two examples. Um, actually, so, uh, so right now I don't have anything running, which is useful because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run go, um, 
uh, go run starter. So I'm going to run the clients uh, by itself, right? So it's, I'm going to run go run starter main dot go. Ah, CD, hello. <laughs> CD here as well. Okay, so this is run. This is this is kicked off that client, uh, the client that we talked about, um, but it hasn't returned anything. Uh, it just says it just says it's running, right? Um, and it hasn't exited. This process that I started off hasn't exited, mainly because I told it to wait for a result, right? Um, workflow execution dot get. Uh, this is this is where you synchronously wait for the workflow completion. Uh, you can you can obviously comment this out if you don't care about the result, uh, which actually a lot of situations call for that. Um, meaning like you you rather asynchronously get that workflow by getting that workflow ID uh, and just saying like, all right, what was the result of this workflow ID that already completed? Um, that that can also be done as well. I I find that pretty important for uh, a lot of application contexts. Um, all right, let's actually see what's uh, what's going on with this workflow. So I can see the workflow ID. I can see the run ID. Uh, this is for if in case a workflow does multiple runs. Um, I can see the input. This is Andrew over here. Uh, it's on, listening on a task queue. Uh, it's got two history events and one state transitions. Um, let's go over to the history side. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see summary. All right. It says workflow execution started and workflow task scheduled. Um, and it's not really progressing beyond that because I don't have a worker to. Uh, to process that work, right? I, I haven't spun up that worker on the left yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, spin up that worker. So again, I'm, I'm moving to that code now, where it's uh, worker may not go. And this registers that workflow and activity, and then it runs that worker, right? So this that's the script. Go run uh, worker slash may not go. Do, do, do. Okie dokie. All right. It says it, it says it instantly completes. It says hello world workflow completed. Blah blah blah. And also on the right, you can see that uh, whatever it was waiting for finishes. It says hello Andrew on the on the right. Um, let's also let's see that uh, in terms of the uh, the workflow event history. Um, if, by the way, I'm refreshing because Gitpod um, has a really interesting bug where it doesn't show you or it doesn't re every time you refresh it doesn't update with the page uh, URL. Um, which is super annoying because now I have, every time I refresh, I'm kicked back out to the, the main page. Uh, you won't have this in your local machine. Anyway, so uh, now we have the result. Now we have 11 history events uh, and it's all good. Um, you can see the entire history of everything that was uh, executed. Um, and this is very, very precise, right? Like we have uh, down to the second, what happened, what's happening. I believe we have even more granular than that, but just for display purposes, we've we got to the second. Um, we can see that the task was scheduled and completed, uh, and then the, the completion was uh, was followed through by the workflow. We have an explainer in the docs about every single one of these events. There are about 40 of them, uh, if you need clarity on what they are. Okay, so um, now you can see like it's fully event source, which is really cool. Um, but the main, the real sort of insight or aha moment I want to show you is how the timeouts and retries uh, come into place. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to hello world.go and we're going to intentionally screw up the activity. We're going to say, I'm going to on purpose I'll throw an error. Um, so I'll just say, oops, over here. Um, okay. Um, and then I'm going to reload my worker. So now the worker has a faulty error with the activity that's going to error every single time because I'm I'm, ret I'm constantly returning this error. I'm not sure if I have to zero this out, by the way, but I think it should be fine if I, if I just return the error. Um, and now I'm going to run the clients again on the right. Ooh, okay, here it goes. Um, so you can see something different on the left-hand side again. The worker has attempt number one, attempt number two, attempt number three, attempt number four, and it shows you the error as well, right? So this, you can already see it retrying and showing that error. Um, it's fantastic. Let's look at what's different here. So uh, we have five history events. We have, we have some state transitions, but more importantly, we have this pending activities thing, which is new. Uh, and we said that um, it's, on, it's on attempt number six now. Uh, the next attempt is going to be attempted in seven seconds, which has probably already happened. Uh, and then the failure, uh, the error message is displayed here as well, which is really cool. 
So you can imagine this uh, bubbling up to your to your console uh, when you actually write a real life application. So um, we were on attempt number six. If I refresh it and I navigate back again because the pod is so weird, um, um, we should be on attempt number seven and it will tell you that the next retry is in two seconds. Um, so that means that the next retry should be, I think it, I think at the seventh attempt is like a minute or something like that. Yeah, it takes, it takes about a minute. Um, so it shows you that the power of the exponential back off. And that's obviously super useful if you have dozens of <laughs> and hundreds of these things failing all at once. You don't want to accidentally DDoS yourself. Um, uh, but the power of the event source system is that Temporal, has, Temporal knows that we're supposed to execute this activity. It's going to keep trying, right? It's going to say, all right, on this task queue, um, th this, this uh, worker is, is trying to handle my activities and task queues. And I'm going to try to keep setting it at work. Uh, but it's going to attempt that work. Uh, this worker is going to attempt that work. And it's going to all keep returning this error, right? Uh, which is pretty interesting. The other thing I'll, I'll show you as well is that um, this worker doesn't have to be running. So I'm going to kill it. My worker has just gone down, right? Um, and it doesn't matter because all the states persisted in temporal server itself, right? So again, if you look at uh, this system over here, um, not, I, I don't have like my app, my application is now independent of this temporal worker, um, temporal worker's reliability and the uh, application itself, but also temporal server. Like this system can go down because it's persisted to a database, right? All right? Let's just go ahead and kill this. So I'm just killing the Docker Compose that runs Temporal Server as well, right? Like the whole system is just down. I'm just simulated like the, the end of the world here. But, um, you know, in, uh, as, far as, as far as the work that I've accepted from my users is concerned, it is always, um, it is always there. As long as I, unless like, the only thing that can take the system down basically is catastrophic loss of the backing database, <laughs> right? Uh, so now when I when I refresh this, uh, temporal uh, the browser will be gone, like temporal server is down, whatever. But when I bring it back up again, uh, it should still be alive, um, as long as I don't uh, nuke the, da the the database every single time. Um, it takes a while to spin up, which is why I'm always very hesitant. Uh, but yeah, here it is, still alive, still trying to do its thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's just like a cockroach. It just keeps going. Just trying to, trying to keep working its task. All right, let's go, let's go fix this so that, um, I, I always feel stressed out when the worker isn't able to do his job. Um, so I'm just gonna not return the error now. Uh, and I'm gonna go run worker. Um, which also illustrates another thing about fixing bugs, which is that, um, the worst case scenario is that you don't make progress on your workflows. And for most bugs, all you do is you hot fix your workers. Um, you can do versioning if you need to run old code versus new code uh, side by side. Um, but a lot of times you don't have to, you can just hot fix them, which is pretty cool. Um, so what we're doing now is uh, we've actually completed that workflow because we brought up an, a worker with a fixed instance of that workflow, uh, of that activity that no longer returns an error. And now we can see all this stuff that we did to it. Um, we can see the history. We can see that we brought the system down for three minutes and 40 seconds. Um, and then when we brought it, brought it back up again, it was able to continue and complete the task and then uh, continue with the rest of the stuff as well. Um, so yeah, that is an illustration of the fault tolerance of Temporal um, and why this system works and why you never have to code this again. Uh, so that's why we talk, that's why we brand ourselves as a system for reliability or sort of mission critical work, because every time we, you know, we accept something like we accept, we accept work and persist it to our database, like it's there, right? Like we, we're able to uh, make every part of the system, including Temporal Server itself, fault tolerant, um, which, is, which is really nice. Chad, anything else to, to add? No, I mean, I was going to uh, mention the same community things you did. Yeah, we're, we're, pretty, we're pretty responsive around there. And in general, <laughs> it's, um, it's not complicated until it is. So feel free to ask. Yeah. Anything else, like, uh, in terms of, like, the job processing world, like, we get, we get questions about, like, what, are the, what alternatives do we compare ourselves to um, in the goal? Yeah, world? There, aren't, there aren't many, mostly because, I mean, uh, pick any workflow or BPM process, you could compare it, but there really aren't any comparisons from the Go world. If you've written a Kubernetes operator and you're familiar with the uh, controller and reconcile loop, um, 
Temporal is one step on top of that that doesn't have all of the bugginess of a reconcile loop, if you're familiar with that uh, piece of Go. But um, if you're familiar with actor systems, workflows are basically actors. If you're familiar with event sourcing, they basically just handle events. Whatever you're familiar with, it's basically just an immutable, replayable set of steps. And go. we just abstract that into your favorite program language. Perfect. Um, all right. Well, uh, there's lots more to talk, discuss, and uh, you know, we love talking about this all day long, but we're going to let you guys go. Um, uh, please feel free to reach out for more questions, but otherwise, have a wonderful Friday. <laughs>